Again, these are for the people that are, aren't completely bored yet. <laughs> if, you're, if you're not bored yet, stay tuned. Um, thank you, boys, including Mike Borja, local local boy Michael Borja. Oh, so Borja. great, we're just signing, a, yeah, we're just signing a, for the band who was just signing stuff. And people, nice. People would bring up Mike's shirt, right? And they were like, don't, so I won't save that for Mike. Uh. And a couple people were like, no, no, sign the back, the front's for Don't ruin it. <laughs> That's great. I just love it. Stop. Just stop. Mike is literally the sweetest man. For the, he did a, they did a bus tour on uh, Thursday, and he took people to his house, where his mother had made everyone snacks, oh, gave, him, like, gave him like parting gifts. <laughs> My mom was following Mike's tweets online and calls me in California, and she's like, you got to get on Twitter and check this out. Mike's mother is so sweet. That was a disturbing realization, though. So Robbie and I had breakfast uh, after the tour with the band, and Robbie said that very thing he just said. And it, then I, I paused mid-oatmeal. I was like, wait a minute, Vivian has Twitter? Yeah. And he, he's like, yes, she follows us all. And I'm like, I owe her such an apology. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's like, you know, you've heard N N N S F W. but yeah. NSFV. It's not safe for Vivian. <laughs> It's not safe for a lot of people. Sure. Yeah, man, but especially Viv. Hey, yeah. Come on, man. Yeah. <laughs> come on, guys. But, uh, come on, Viv. <laughs> yeah, and then we were joking that I said, yeah, Vivian's. He said, Viv's on Twitter? I said, yeah, it's, uh, she's at, at Vivian Winchester. <laughs> at Vivian underscore Winchester. No, that's a joke, so don't look for her as Vivian Winchester. She's not. But I was like, what if her thing was like, you know, Vivian, like, at Viv loves the trickster. Yeah, well, we did have a funny run-in with Viv one time. We were coming off a panel that was Rob, Matt, and myself. And, you know, you do this whole thing, and Rob's like, oh, the mom's finally here to see me do a panel and see me be funny as we come off the stage. Um, and she goes, I should let you do it. Could you do it? Well, she'd never seen me do a, a panel before. This is her first time she'd seen a convention, any of this stuff. So I was very thrilled to have her in the eyes of reference her on stage. It's me, him, and Matt. And uh, afterwards, we get off stage. I'm like, so we're all walking back to the green room. I said, Mom, it's your first time you saw me do a panel. Like, what did you think? She's like, No, it was good, but my question's for Matt. So Matt, she like beeline to Matt just the whole time. If you walked to Matt the whole way back, like, yeah. so Matt. <laughs> Asked him all about his, the soap and taking his shirt off and stuff. It's great. Yeah, her Twitter handle is uh, Gabe Girl. <laughs> yeah. It's like going, going for life. Or, yeah. Oh, uh, I guess we'll take questions. I mean, we're here, you're here, why not? You know, we get the microphones. Sure. Hi. Rob, you were a gift to this fandom. Thank you for being in it. Yeah. Um, Rich, my question is actually for you. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's always, when you get a compliment... Yeah, we know. <laughs> we literally know, like, Rich, I love your shirt, I love your whole thing. You're blocking my view of Rob. <laughs> you're, uh... Not what I meant. Um, I just wondered, when you had to do season 13 Gabriel that has been beaten up by Asmodeus for so long, how long did that makeup process take, and is that the hardest special effects makeup that you've ever had to do for a show? Are you dressed like yes. season 13 Gabriel <laughs> yes. right now? I'm just now noticing, I mean, because honestly, you wear it, it looks fashionable on you. It really looks, does. It looks like, a, like hot pajamas, kind of. Yeah. Let's see, come up here, let's see the whole, let's see the whole oh, thing. Hey, you. Just uh, come on up so I can see the... The whole bit. They're not gonna attack me. Oh, yeah. oh wow, did you do the whole the makeup of the face? Wow. Right the way. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah, it is. Now, now close your mouth and go, mmm. -hmm. That's what I said. She did. She knows my dialogue. Um, that's awesome. Um, so the question was how long did the makeup take? It took shockingly long. Uh, for starters, do you guys do you, everybody knows that I came back on the show. Is that a thing we all know? Yeah, I guess so. So the, and the makeup was that they had to sew my mouth shut and or have my mouth sewn shut with the prosthetic and it was the 
I, the, the show's been filled with ups and downs for you know 13 years. So they've had babies born, they've had marriages, they've had a lot going on in that show. Still, me having my mouth sewn shut was one of the happiest days that crew has ever experienced. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean. I tried to get a plane ticket yeah, to fly there because I wanted to see it. Rob had so a great excited. day somewhere else, yeah, just like exactly. this. Awesome. <laughs> um, I remember, I remember reading the, the breakdown. Andrew sent me. He's like, "Here's here's how they find you," and they described it. And I thought, "Oh, uh, my my wife is in the writers' room. That's great. That's it." <laughs> That's great. Um, so it was a long process. It took about an hour and a half because these were all uh, real pieces. Obviously, it wasn't just blood like the cuts. This was one piece that the first day I did it, I actually couldn't speak, but it was only two hours of work to shoot the scene, so it wasn't that big a deal. Um, the rest of the time, they had it kind of where they, they could, I could move my mouth and drink and eat, not a lot, but enough where I could survive a, you know, all day in it. But they, it, was the, it was all the, once they do the makeup the first time, splatter all that blood all over you, then they have to replicate it exactly the same. So it almost took longer after the fact because he was so like, ha, ha, and then they're going dot, 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 like trying to match where his flings happen. But they did these really great prosthetics that were cuts, it looked really cool. It was really freaky looking. I mean, just to look at myself, it was really cool art in terms of how they, they put it all together. So it, for me, it was, I, one time years ago when I was in my 20s, I did a prosthetic that was a, like an alien piece that, um, probably took around the same time, I had no nose as that alien. And it turns out if you can't sniff, the waterfall is just gonna flow, it's just gonna go. And it was real gross, Rob. <laughs> the, removal, the removal of that makeup was, let's just say, unsettling at best. But the story's unsettling. This not so bad. But there is a picture, I, I should tweet it at some point, because at one point I had to go from that game to I got my power back, and I'm up there, my wings are coming out and all that, so they had to clean me up. And I had uh, all the makeup and hair team that we know so well and love so much, all on different hands and feet and face trying to scrub it off, because it was so gross. It was also a terrible job for them to have to do that, but like, I was so dirty. I think the makeup of the hands, the makeup of the feet was all just caked on there. It was, it was I'm always dirty, but not... <laughs> Not, the, not in that way. Not the kind of dirty you can clean, you know what I mean? This is a, a different kind of dirty. Um, so yeah, it was about an hour and a half. It was a, it was a I, I thought a cool process. It, they even made a comment like, wow, you really don't seem to mind this. I'm like, this is awesome. This is like watching painters do amazing work, only I'm the canvas. I thought it was really cool. Um, by the way, thank you for the cosplay. Nice job. Thanks for the question. You, sir. Hi, I'm Kevin. Hey Kevin. I love you guys. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, man. I got a question for Rich. Hi. Right. I've been curious for the last two days. A few days. About what drugs are up Rob's ass. Oh. <laughs> That's a fair. That, that, well, I got these for you to try out. Okay, what are they? Bring them up. They're rubber gloves? Yes. Can you find out what they are and tell us, please? Yeah, okay. We can do that. We can do that. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. Uh, I gotta, safety first. I gotta think, guys. I'm gonna. <laughs> this is great. Now hold on, Robbie. This, this is just rubber gloves. Oh, no, no, this no, will no. tell you something. The man asked a legitimate question. Here, you, you can have one in oh, case you want to. This. <laughs> what? This is, this is one of those scenarios. <laughs> what? Where you have created lying out of thin air <laughs> that has nothing to do with anything, and now it's a thing. <laughs> it's reminiscent of the Rob Hates Perth thing where all of a sudden Rich decided I hate Perth, Australia, city I've never been to. I don't, have, I don't have any opinion, but I love everything, so I'm sure I'm gonna love it. And Rich says to the people of Australia, this man hates Perth, and now there are t shirts. Yeah. Google Rob Hates Perth, and you will see a slew of t shirts and the ass. High quality man. shirts, nice shirts. And, you say to, and he's made half of them, and you say to this man, <laughs> Why did you just say that? And he's like, hey man, uh, no, we're all curious why he ate perfect. <laughs> now, the, 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 the drugs up the butt thing. Here's the thing. And you're d giving me a full cavity search. <laughs> I'm, the five people of Pittsburgh. I'm trying to answer a man's question. All right. He wants to know what narcotics you keep up the shoot. All right, let's do it. That's not a reasonable. <laughs> <laughs> 
reminds me of Rubric. <laughs> um, yeah, the the we'll, we'll move on for the Rob Narcotics uh, no, no, Native please. Question Box. I don't mean. But I just it's one of those things at this point, it would be great if you're like, Flowers. Yeah. Rabbit. Tile oil bottle. <laughs> it's really not much, guys. Advil. Uh, a pharmacist. Yeah. <laughs> Hello? <laughs> Thank, you. <laughs> Thank you for getting me out of this bottle. Um, Claustrophobic in there. Uh, the drug in your bottom thing, I don't know how it started. We could, again, I don't know how it started. I don't. It happened we in a convention. have been in a city that was drug friendly, say, Seattle. Makes sense. That, you know, where pot is legal. Right. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, like you do, it came around to, I've got it in my bottle. <laughs> and there was a song that came out of that. about there was a song. Uh, about Bobby, Bobby Drugs in the Butthole, Bobby, Bobby, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Bo, Bobby, Bobby Drugs no, in the Butthole. It's hit. Um, Bingo, bango, babo. But yeah, you, yeah, you, you actually made up a whole. Th like, there was a whole thing. Yeah. Uh, but was it? You'll what? find the thing online. You find the thing for us, and you'll Just tweet it out. Yeah. <laughs> drugs and rubs. B hole. I got news for you. If you, if you search drug, drugs and rubs. B hole. Prepare for a long feed. It's a lot of. <laughs> <laughs> this has come up on stage uh, a lot. Here's a question. Yeah. Um, was it when I w got stopped going into England? It might have been that. I got stopped going into England because we were in a band and we didn't have a work permit, so we got deported. Right. It was, a, it was, a, it was just an uncomfortable, bad situation. That we're just some musicians. Right. No drugs involved. Maybe it was that. I don't know. I don't know. I just know that now it's become a thing, and now it's one of those things that it's out there, so we can fight against it, but we can't, we can't disprove the theory. So we might as well just... I want this picture online. We're like, just having an honest conversation. Here's the thing. Um, two men in rubber gloves having a frank and honest conversation about the narcotics you keep in your anus. Oh, it's a microphone. Um, anyway, uh, thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Thank, thank you for the, the gloves. Thank you for the gloves. The gloves are really nice. Um, you. Hello. Hello. Um, my question is for both of you, I guess. Um, <laughs> you guys have done a lot of different forms of acting. Uh, feature films, episodes, and a lot of people ask what your favorite TV series or movie was you worked on. But my question is, what was your favorite short film you ever worked on? And how that experience differs from television or feature film? Short film, okay. Um, for me, it's, I, I think I know what you're going to say, but for me, a similar answer. Yeah, yeah, for me, it's America 101, but that's a film I was not in, but I wrote it and I directed it. And I'm very proud of the work on that film, and I'm a, I, I still love the message of that film. And also, that's the film that helped me break into directing for you know for people who write checks and have television shows. So it was a it was a big career turning point to do that short film, take it on the road, play festivals with it, and then that's you know that was the beginning of my breaking into directing professionally. So for me, it has a a warm place in my heart, and it's available on iTunes. If anybody wants to watch America 101, there it is. Robbie? Similar answer is, would be a movie that I made called The Sidekick. Um, I didn't direct it. I really have no, I had no aspirations to be a director, but I would have directed this simply because I wanted it to be done. Uh, for me, it was about writing and being in something, writing a part for myself that I really wanted to play. And uh, so I wrote this short, and then this filmmaker, Michael Whitehorn, um, was like, I want to direct this, and so it kind of all came together, and I'm just like, super proud of it because, you know, it's something I wrote and produced, it was the first thing that I had done that with, that I'd actually gotten done, and, uh, and that too is available on the iTunes and the Amazon and all that stuff. Perfect. You're going to have a Robin Rich uh, short film festival. I mean, I've already watched them all, so... <laughs> <laughs> I remember my, my, my dad, I was do, doing, doing uh, film festivals with America 101, I did a, we played about 35 festivals and I went to as many as I possibly could. But the thing was, when in the festival circuit, unless it's a designated festival for shorts, like, like Palm Springs Shorts Fest or something, the, uh, festivals bring in the feature filmmakers, but they uh, typically don't bring in the people who made the shorts. And I was talking to my father, I'm like, yeah, I'm having to, you know, fly myself all over the country because um, they won't... They won't fly short filmmakers. My dad goes, why is there a height requirement? <laughs> That's great. Uh, Dick. That's great. Solid stuff. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Rock solid. 
If you've ever done a bus tour with, with my father, you know, yeah, that sounds like him. Um, <laughs> all right, thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi. Hey. Uh, so I take a lot away from like every experience that I have, and I try to learn something every time I do it. And I was wondering what the greatest lesson that you have learned after meeting so many people at conventions, like the greatest thing that you've taken away from it. The, ba the greatest uh, lesson we've learned meeting the fine folks of the, okay. Um, hmm. There are many. Yeah, so many. Um, I mean, this whole experience has really changed uh, our lives, changed the, the course of our life in so many ways. Um, I think it's just, I, I wouldn't say there's anything that I was like, oh, I didn't know that before, but it's strengthened things that I always believed in and, and kind of brought it to the forefront for me. The idea of acceptance and tolerance. Um, I just think that that's something this group has that's so important, and I just wish that well, my, my, my wish is that we carry that outside these doors with us every day, you know, acceptance and tolerance of others. And, um, you know, it's something that it would change the fucking world if we could do that. And uh, so that's something I'm reminded of, you know, every day. Um, this, you know, um, and I was, you know, just being positive with people and being. You know, it's, it's so easy in, you know, in L.A. especially, you get, we're trapped in our cars, we're, we're just riding around in pods all day, we're not talking to other people, and so easy to get kind of like, just within your own head and maybe a little negative. And uh, Rich is so great with people, he comes from the Southern family, he's, he's so good at like, he makes friends, he goes into a CBS and he makes friends with the guy working the counter. I'm very much the opposite, I'm a typical Los Angeles guy where I'm like, don't oh, talk to me, oh Jesus, you know, and I, it's so easy for me to get into that world. And he brings me out of my shell because he's always like, hey, Frank, how you doing? The guy's like, pretty good, Rich, how are you? How's the family? I'm like, how do you fucking know each other so well? It's it's like, me up. It is funny. Uh, Rob's obviously selling himself a little short. He's a very social guy. But it's funny that I do have that thing where I, I kind of get to know the people in my universe a little bit. And we were in the office when I'm working. I'm like, I need to get my car repaired. And I pulled into the, I pulled in, and the mechanic is like, hey, Rich. Give her a whirl on the thing, like, you know it, buddy. There you go. He turned the keys, like, how do you know your mechanic? Yeah. Like, he's like, he's like, hey, Cliff. And he's like, he's like, no, don't throw me keys. I got the spare. I already had him. <laughs> <laughs> Walking to lunch with this guy. He's like, hey, Larry. JJ, how are you? Freaky. Like, he knows everybody. <laughs> um, you know, <laughs> how's your mom? Uh, he knows every story about everybody. Anyway, my point is, being around you all, it does bring me out of my shell, and it makes me positive, and I'm just so thankful for every interaction that I have here, I really am. Yeah, you know, I think, I, there's a, it's an interesting question. Um, meeting people, and that sounds like a, a half-assed answer, but there's so many people from so many walks of life that, uh, who have gotten to meet, a new story I wouldn't know if my job didn't put me on this stage. I, I have a job that puts me in front of a camera, but not all those shows have a convention following. It, it, it happened to be specifically Supernatural that put, put me in Rob and all of us in this universe. And that has led, a, led to us having these interesting exchanges with, with various people from various walks of life that I wouldn't necessarily have, have met with. I've, I've met a lot of fantastic people from the military, military families, current, former, and future, doing these conventions. I, I have been exposed and met a lot of the, and I'm gonna, if I say this acronym wrong, please stop me, but the LGBT uh, family. I met a, a ton of, of people in that universe, and being an actor, being a L.A. guy, I have a, a you know, a, any, somebody's sexuality is their business, not mine, and I'm all for everything, so I'm already an you know, uber-liberal guy, but I didn't necessarily meet people who are on a journey from one side to the other, and all the things that you, you see in the supernatural fandom that make it so awesome. It's, it has confirmed and, and reaffirmed my faith in humanity to be at these events to witness the passion people have for what they do, not just what I do, but what they do. We'll sit around these meet and greets and people are paid money to come in a room and talk to us, but one of them's a prison guard, one of them's a, a, a nurse for you know needy children, one is traveling, like all these jobs are so impressive and so unique and interesting and honestly, quite frankly, more important than what we do. And so it's, it's humbling to get the opportunity to do something that puts me in the path of people whose, whose career choices and whose personal choices I uh, admire.
and 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 find uh, very impressive, and I find strength in their in their choices because it's not always easy easy path one picks, and it's always cool to watch people doing what they do and doing it well. So it's it's the people. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Uh, I want to say thank you for being an ally because I personally don't get that often, and I don't think that the allies hear that enough. So thank you so much. The a being an ally being, for the LGBT community, it means a lot, and I don't think that the allies hear it enough. Uh, you know, they probably don't hear it enough. I don't think it's a conversation that people have. I, you know, you're welcome. I think we're gifted with this opportunity to be on a stage with microphones and, and phones pointed at us, recording what we say. So a lot of times our messages get a little more traction than a conversation in a coffee shop, but it is, it is truly um, a pleasure to get to know uh, that community, the, the members of that community, and to be an advocate for them. Uh, and it makes, <laughs> it's sad that they need advocates because it's, it's like saying, why would I advocate for left-handed people? It's just who you are. Like it's, this is your journey, this is your story, this is your genetic man, so this is who you are. I'm happy to advocate it because if people don't get it, I'm happy to explain it to them. But I'll tell you one thing, and Robbie know, Robbie knows, I don't like I don't one thing I don't like. I don't like it when people in other places tell members of that community that they're not fit to serve in the military or do other things that people do. That's a that's if you if you are brave enough to take a bullet for the freedom of your nation, I don't give a shit what you do in the sheets, kid. I I, I have a lot of respect and admiration for anybody who does that. And um, tolerance, acceptance, all of these words, I hope tolerance and acceptance are words that are no longer needed to describe that community in a very, in, in very short years because it should be as common as left-handed, right-handed, or net redheads, you know? Yep. Yeah. So thank you. Hey, you too. Hey. So you, Matt, and a bunch of other reoccurring cast members have met my very unique fan art. And by the way, last year, your reactions was probably my top five. Okay. Rob, that was really unmanly, running away from a fox. <laughs> that was really unmanly. I, I, don't, remember, I don't remember the, the running away from the fox. I don't know if I do too, but it sounds like me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes. what, 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 what? Remind was, us what happened? It was the fox that looked like Castillo. It was last year. Right. Rob was like, oh! <gasps> And then you ran, and that was probably one of my favorite moments ever. Yeah. Yeah, yeah so. Right. Well done. <laughs> so, You're running from the fox bit. So here's the deal. Um, I asked this question to John Berriman earlier this year, and I want to ask you guys, um, what are some fan art forms that you haven't seen that you would like to? If Matt was here, I'd tell him I'd like to see him portrayed as Magic Mike, because he likes to get down dirty in karaoke. <laughs> Rob would like to see him portrayed as either Biblical Jesus or God. And then Rich, you're going to love this, Azrael gave me her blessing. Okay, so I'd like to see you uh, carved out of the Moby, which is $550, three foot long, and the world's largest retail redacted on Amazon. That way girls can say they saw some really good looking redacted. I don't understand anything that would be said there. I don't know. I'm carved out of $550 of what? $550, it's three foot long, it's the world's largest retail, I'm gonna say dildo, so that way we oh, can say it's not yeah, really going, good. I I don't know what we're, I, right. I had no idea where that was being, where that was going. Yeah, totally. You can yeah. have a dick dick. Ah, oh, I get it. I'd be I, like your pharmacist. <laughs> <laughs> right. Just like my butthole pharmacist, exactly. Uh, uh, you know, this is one of those topics. Oh, I God. Um, I, you know, uh, if sure. there aren't shirts that have Rob's butthole pharmacist. No. On Redbubble by the end of the weekend, you people have failed me. We're talking about your... We're talking about your dick dick right now. Um, you go first. Huh? Dick dick or... <laughs> I don't think there's a question in there. Well, she said, I don't know. No, her, her question was, is there any fan art of yourself that you haven't seen that you'd like to? Personally, I've seen a lot of great and creative stuff yeah. that I couldn't even start to try to be more creative than that. No. When Richard and I did Kings of Khan, we encouraged people to send in um, fan art based on our Kings of Khan characters. Yeah. And we got the most amazing things, like uh, the rubber band ma people made out of rubber band Robin Rich. Well, made out of, like the quilts that are Yeah, the things. quilts. Um, and, you know, artwork, cartoons. Um, our fans just remaking a video of something that they've seen. Like, it just, 
the, the stuff blows me away. Ah, the, so much. The artists in this community are amazing. Um, so I, I don't think I could do better. Yeah, than I don't think, I've, nothing, I've, I've never thought, gee, I wish they'd make me out of popsicle sticks. Like, I've never had a thing uh, that came to mind. I, but I, like Rob, am blown away by the creativity and the, and the artistry of the fandom. It's truly, truly impressive. I mean, there's some yeah. really great stuff out there. And like, this is awesome. There's a bobble, I've got a bobblehead set of Loud and Swain that's um, like in plexiglass that's in my office at home. And uh, every time I see it, it's right next to my printer and I'm always like, God, I'm so proud of that. Because <laughs> the details in like, it's the stage, all of our albums are on the front of the stage. I know they're my iPad about, yeah. is there, it's like, it's- like, you, you don't have a ton of fan art in our office. Yeah. Rob and I share an office, we have a lot of, of stuff that, you know, we try to keep as much of it as we can, and since we have an office, we can display it. We have a lot of this stuff out there. And we have it on the window. Our office looks out into other offices. You know, it's like, there's a central conference room and all these other uh, offices around it. So our window is just filled with great art. Uh, <laughs> One of, them, one of them being a prop from Kings of Con, which is a photo of us in a heart that says, Just, Just Married. <laughs> so I'm sure a lot of people heard the comments were like, and I, oh, well, congr congratulations. You know, I did a Google, a Google search, I was showing someone something. It might have been the Rob Hates Perth thing. But I was like, Rob Benedict, and it fills in. And it was like, and Richard Spate married, question <laughs> mark? And it might have been like, are we married to other, to the people that they want to see who our wives are, or whatever. Right. But to me, it meant like, kind of are they really married? Who's to say? <laughs> uh, like the drugs in your beehole, we right. may never know. That's right. Thank you for the question. Thank you for the question. Thanks. Uh, hi. So my, uh, my question's about how, like, Gabriel died, like, the last time. Um, so I know there's so many deaths to choose from. This yeah. book. So uh, Lucifer killed Gabriel with, uh, like, regular angel blade. Right. But only an archangel blade could kill an archangel. Right. So why did Lucifer think that you were dead, even though, like, the fake version of you was killed with a regular... I'm so glad you asked that. This is something that people haven't realized. Lucifer is stupid. <laughs> Why else would you lean on evil so heavily? You have no other tools in your toolbox. He's just not a bright guy. <laughs> I fooled him. It was too simple. I just, you know I, mean? I wish Pellegrino was backstage right I'm now. I'm really glad he's not. <laughs> Is he here this weekend? Yeah. Hey. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, we never had this conversation. But, uh, by Lucifer, I mean, I mean Tom Ellis. Yeah. Damn it. I'm screwed. Um, thank you for the question. You. Hi. Um, I was wondering, it's, I mean, it's kind of towards both of you. So, in this previous season, we figured out Gabe is still alive and he was in hell the whole time. Why didn't God save him during like Thank you! Thank you for asking the question. Thank you for addressing the elephant on the planet. Why, Cheers. why, why? Cheers. Robbie? It's, it's the is yours. This is a can of worms, and this is what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm sorry, what was the question? Um, <laughs> No, I think I had stated when I was back in season 11 that, uh, uh, well, that I didn't have time to bring Gabriel back. Bad Dad says what? So, <laughs> as it turns out, Gabriel was in trouble, but I just had a lot of other things on my plate. It was like, save the world, reconcile relationships. You had sister. time to build a pool hall for yourself that was easy. with your own stand. That's true. So you can sing to yourself. Well, it meant a lot to me. <laughs> you have been a bad son. <laughs> and I was teaching you a lesson. Well, guess what you're getting for Father's Day? A big wrapped up box of Jack Squat! Well, like I've gotten anything ever before from you. Oh, you've been so too busy kowtowing to the stupid one. I will sew your lips back together so quick. I want you! I know! I mean, Aha! You heard him say it. <laughs> when your sons are Gabriel and Lucifer, I don't know if you have any parents in the audience, but you hear me. It's difficult. You don't always make the greatest choices because you're so angry. I'm happy for you that you came back. And, you know, 
You're not dead in my book. You're still very much alive. Well, it's... <clears throat> and my plan is... I'd love to read your book because... It's it, my plan. I know. I've been writing this a whole... It's a whole thing. <laughs> but uh, my plan is, we've got a couple more seasons left. Maybe you and I come on back together to the door, linking arms, father and son, back together again, both alive and well. I... We have often been asked, like, what, what would be your favorite episode of Supernatural that it hasn't happened, and, and I've decided what it is. We've talked about it before. I so badly want them to have an episode, eh, this alternate universe, normal universe, or whatever, where we have... I'm going to leave some people out here on, not on purpose, but you have Balthazar, you have Charlie, you have uh, Lucifer, Gabriel, you have uh, Kane, you have uh, you Crowley, you have all these people, and it's Rob in the middle, and it's the Last Supper. <laughs> Obviously, Sam and Dean and Misha, and it's like you have this, this that image in this, and so you go all, you go into the various conversations, but overall, it's you in the middle going. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like giving a blessing. So this, no, it's actually it's the exasperated version. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> anyway, oh, thank you for the question. Thank Very you. Much. Thank you. Um. Rob, your music has influenced me and in my writing a lot, and I was wondering what some big musical influences for you were. It's a great question. Um, you know, Rich and I both just, I mean, always been a huge fan of so many different styles of music and kinds of music. Um, so, I mean, I was influenced as a, as a young boy by, my, my dad was a, a DJ, and so he would bring records home. His stuff was like big band music and jazz music. Um, and so I was sort of, uh, as a young kid, sort of would listen to that on the stereo. But then I also have older brothers and sisters, so they bring home disco and, you know, and then like 80s pop and like MTV, and I was really influenced by that. But then when I started songwriting, I was really influenced by um, U2 was a huge influence of mine, um, and R.E.M., these, these bands in the late 80s that um, really like affected me emotionally. I would get, I mean, you two wrote some songs that would bring me to tears, and I'm really taken with that idea that he, Bono, was so passionate about what he was singing, you know? And even the live albums, when before he'd sing the song, he'd say what it's about, he'd tell the story about Sunday Bloody Sunday, and I'd be fired up listening to the, you know, I just love that, that idea. Um, and then later for me, Pearl Jam, again, I just, I love songwriters and performers that are passionate about what they've written, and so Eddie Vedder is that for me. In terms of a songwriter, those are really are, I'd say Bono and, and Eddie Vedder are two big influences of mine. Um, just writing music that you feel passionate about, that when you sing it, it, it buoys you, it gives you strength, you know, like lifts you up, you know, that's what my goal is. Rich, did you, did, what your influences are? Oh man, I mean, I think probably my biggest, maybe I'm not a songwriter per se, but musically, big R.E.M. fan. Grew up with R.E.M. Love the lyrics of R.E.M., love Michael Stipe's voice, just a huge, huge fan. Uh, but like you, man, I so me, I'm a huge Stones yeah. fan. And a huge, like. And you also like country music, some country music. I like old school country music for sure, like you know, uh, George Jones and Johnny Cash and Willie Nelson, that kind of stuff. Johnny Cash is another one here, you know, he's a songwriter that, you know, he was, his, you feel it when he's singing those songs, you feel he's angry about something. Yeah, and you think, like, Willie Nelson, what a prolific songwriter he was. You go, go back and buy. Willie Nelson's demo sessions, and you suddenly realize, oh, he wrote all these songs. <laughs> like, he didn't record them. They got famous. Patsy Cline did Crazy, and somebody else did Hello Walls, and other stuff. But his his library of work as a songwriter is stunning. It's amazing how, how good those guys are. I have a lot of respect for songwriters. It's not not a skill I have, and I admire it a tremendous amount. So wherever that young person is, good luck. Good luck with your writing. Yes. Can Keep I, going with it. Yes, and I'm glad you're inspired to write. Um, our right hands are going to be very clean at the end of this. They're going to be sweaty messes. <laughs> Hello. Hello. My question is for both of you. If you had to make a choice, would you choose working in front of the camera or behind it? Robbie? Um, I would choose working in front of the camera. I love writing, um, but I also like acting as my first joy. Um, you know, writing for me, I could write all day and, and not at the end of it have the need to have someone read it it's just I'm kind of inspired by the writing of something. Um, but at the end of the day, I, I love being an actor. And that was always, since I was a young kid, that was always my, my, my goal, is to be an actor. Rich, that's a tougher question for you. And thank you for, for 
if I really had to make a choice, I would, I would stay behind the camera. I really enjoy writing. Uh, it's a, something I have a real passion and drive for, and I really like the directing. Really enjoying getting to tell the story in a bigger way than just the role I've been given as an actor. I was explaining that to somebody in the meet and greet. I was saying, like, to me, directing is, and I love acting. Make no mistake, I love it and, and intend to continue doing it uh, for the rest of my days, but when you're acting, especially if you're guest starring on a show, it's not your show, you're coming in and you've been cast as the, as the color red, so you're gonna go up to the canvas and be red everywhere they need red. But when you're the director, the whole painting comes from your mind. The writer has given you the blueprint and you put every color you can on that. And to me, I really enjoy that process. I have been spoiled by getting to cut my teeth with one of the greatest casts and crews in the business, which is the good people of Supernatural. And so I'm, I'm just loving getting to do what I'm doing right now. So if I had to choose, which we don't, but if I had to choose, I would say behind the camera. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Which is great for me being his business partner. Is I'd be like, that's right, so, so you can direct it, and I can be in it. <laughs> Which is what we always talk about, so it's, it's a legit conversation. Hello. Hi. Um, so my question is, what's the craziest or funniest conversation or situation that you've ever been involved with or has happened to you? Baba? <laughs> so many to choose from. Well, let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's whittle it down to just me and you, things that you and I craziest conversation or situation we've had. One of my favorites that we've talked about before was at Comic-Con a couple years ago where you um, you got real mad and left the party. And, and That's a good one. Yeah, Rob got, Rob got, uh, Rob was overserved at, at a, at a <laughs> network function. <laughs> and uh, so I, I didn't know it was alcohol. Something got it, well, it was like, it was like somebody, somebody put beer in this beer bottle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I got, I, I don't, know what ticked you off, but somehow Bobby made a beeline for the door, and he was gone. And I'm like, oh no. And then he called me, and we're like, where's Rob? I don't know. It was San Diego. It's, you know, people are weird. You're not going to get hurt. It's a friendly environment doing that. But I finally get a call from him going, I'm bad shape, Rich. <laughs> Fucked up. I'm in bad shape. Where'd you go? I don't know. I got real mad. I left. I'm like, yeah, I'm aware. <laughs> Where'd you go? I don't know. I don't know where I am, Rich. Lost. Lost, Rich. What am I going to do? I'm like, all right, calm down. You take your cell phone. I'm on it. I'm using the phone to talk. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Pull it away from your ear. And you're just going to hit an Uber button. Or get, you know what? And actually, you didn't. It wasn't Uber. You got to go just hail a cab. I don't see a cab. I'm like, I'll wait until you get in the... I'll wait. So I said, and, and you know, just get the cab. I'll stay here with you. And I'll tell the cabbie where, you, where to bring you. Fucked up, Rich. I got it the first five times. Just, <laughs> I'm just waving the cab. He's pulling over, Rich. That's a good thing. That's what you want him to do. That's how you don't have to run alongside him and go through the window. This is good. <laughs> he's in the car, and he comes like back. He's like, with the car, Rich. The driver seems to know where he's taking me. All right. Feel better, Rich. All right, great. So like, get over here. We're going to get you back to the hotel. And he gets in. He gets to the space. I meet him outside, he gets out, like, I don't know what happened, Rich, not, not, good, not in good shape, I need to go back to the hotel. I'm like, no problem, let's get you back to the hotel. And I was like, ask the cab driver, where was he? And it turns out Rob had called the cab from right in front of our hotel. <laughs> <laughs> so I just round tripped it, and right on back home. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was a tricky one. I woke up the next morning with that, the receipt of the cab, and I was like, we took a cab last night? I really, really been overserved. But uh, that, that so thing called Sierra Nevada, but it was iced tea. And um, then, um, th 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 it might have been that same Comic-Con, uh, I was waiting for Rich downstairs uh, for our call time. We were doing uh, some press there, um, and uh, Rich, uh, and I, I noticed this uh, young lady standing at the, uh, like, checking into the hotel. And uh, she was wearing uh, red pants, nicely fit, with red pants, a lovely looking lady. And uh, she had a nice bottom. I thought, well, that's a nice bottom, tucked into those trousers. <laughs> and uh, I'll have to tell Rich about this lady. And he goes down, really admiring this lady and her bottom. And then the lady turns around and it's Rich's wife. 
And I immediately was like, oh God, what have I done? What have I done? I thought I died. I died. I mean, I was like so horrified. So Rich came down and I went right up to him. I was like, God, Rich, uh, I did a bad thing. Uh, I did not know it was your wife. She was turned around and fired her bottom. And she took, that was your wife, but I would never have, I would have done that. Rich, that was the funniest thing you've ever heard. He, he beeline to his wife. He's like, you gotta hear this. Guess, guess who's been eyeballing your hindquarters for the last 20 minutes? Bobo. <laughs> I'll never live it down. To this day, I feel self-conscious around her, like, uh. <laughs> and he's like this, hi, how are you? Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, and, and the crazy thing about that story is I never had to tell anybody. I would never have had to tell anybody. No, nobody fine. knew. It was your own thing. The great thing. We, we, Rob and I, for the first few years of friendship, had a lot of conversations that started with Rob going, I fucked up, Rich. <laughs> And, and the other thing that was funny about that is, that's what I learned, it doesn't work anymore, but early on, Rob was real susceptible to texting confusing messages. So, say we had to meet in the lobby <laughs> at 8 for work, and it'd be 7.45. That's it. Like, 15 minutes before he'd be down there. And I would just text him, where are you, question mark, explanation point. And that would send him into a panic. Remember, you were like, where am I, 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 where am I supposed to be? What's I supposed to be? I'm, I'm in the, I'm in the, where are you? I mean, I literally, ding, it opens up and I walk out. He's literally walking around going, where am I, what are you, what are you doing? I'm like, I just asked where you were. You're, we're still 10 minutes. like, asshole. Uh, I did that to you all the time. Remember, remember one time I said, meet me, I direct, we were literally, Literally meeting at an airport, I'm like, you here, buddy? Yeah, we doing this? Let's beer it up. And I was I had this whole conversation. I was 20 minutes away from the airport. I was literally like, dude, I'm right here. Sit, I'm waving at you. You're like, where? I don't I'm see looking you. all over you. I don't see you. Oh, no, that was, that you was were mad. You were mad. You were mad. That was like a couple of years ago. Yeah, Burbank you were P.O. Yeah. And I got, great. Okay. Oh, you got me. This yeah. is funny. Funny. Ha ha. Um, anyway, I don't know where the person is, but... Thank you. Oh, thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. You. Hi. Um, if you had your character's powers, what would you do with them in general, and to Jared and Jensen in particular? <laughs> well, if I had the power to do anything, because of oh, God, God, the first thing I'd do would be create a world where we have a absolute uh, tolerance of everybody based on sexuality, religion, creed, race, so that we all put our fucking weapons down and relax and live in peace together, because it's just one planet. And then after that, I'd make Jared trade me his height for one day. <laughs> it's funny, I was gonna say the same. I would make those, I would make those guys short. <laughs> so just for once in our once in our life, we could hear Jared Dinsen say, Hey, uh, could you grab that for me? <laughs> Man, I'd like to hear that. Yeah. Sure thing, buddy. Yeah. No problem. Is this what you wanted? <laughs> Give him a little pat on the butt. Yeah. Oh, look, a little pharmacist fell out. <laughs> <laughs> That's from Benedict, everybody. everybody. Richard Slate Jr. Thank you, everybody. It's a hydrate and uh, put some uh, food in your belly. It's break time. Break time. So, everybody, thanks for being here. We'll see you in a little bit. Get thanks again, everybody. Woo!